Hi, my name is Sandy Chung, President of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you so much for having me here today. Today I'll be talking about a very serious topic, preventing youth suicide. I have nothing to disclose. Let's first talk about the impact of the pandemic on children. COVID-19 and the efforts to mitigate the spread of the disease resulted in social isolation, parental morbidity and mortality, removal of support systems, and financial strain. All of these are known risk factors for poor mental health. We also know that COVID-19, the disease, had a significant impact on morbidity and mortality of people, especially adults and the elderly. As of May 1st of 2022, over 10 million children have lost a caregiver or a parent because of COVID-19, leaving over 7 million children orphaned, as according to the World Health Organization. The consequences of orphanhood can last a lifetime, as we know, and we must pay special attention to these children to ensure that they achieve optimal health. In the United States in the fall of 2021, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association all declared a national emergency in child and adolescent mental health. And then last fall in 2022, we renewed that declaration. In our country, childhood mental health is not a new issue. Um, and that is probably true in Mexico as well. We, and here you can see, according to the Center for Disease Control in the United States, that the trend for feeling hopeless or sad for our high schoolers, experiencing poor mental health, thinking about suicide, or even making a plan or, or trying to attempt suicide, all of these have been trending in the wrong direction. In the United States, suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 24 year olds. And during the pandemic, even though uh, for during the pandemic, we really saw a drop in the number of children coming to emergency rooms for medical illnesses, we actually saw quite an increase in children showing up to the emergency room with mental health emergencies. This not only included adolescents, but our young school age children as well. And pediatricians are seeing it in our practices. Um, when we asked our pediatricians who had experienced or been exposed to a patient who had suicide, 92% of our pediatricians said that they've had a patient tell them that they've been thinking about suicide. 80% have had a patient who have tried suicide. And then 48% have had a patient attempt or die by suicide just in the past year. So to help that, the American Academy of Pediatrics, along with multiple organizations, came together to develop a blueprint for youth suicide prevention. This document's available for free online, so I highly recommend that you take a look at it if you haven't had a chance to see it before. As pediatricians, we have a unique opportunity to intervene in early in the way that we think about uh, preventing suicide and in improving youth mental health. We see children over their lifespan. Uh, we see them from a developmental perspective and we grow up with them and we, saw, we know their families and we know where they live and we know how they live um, often. And so we as pediatricians have a unique opportunity in suicide prevention, not only when they're adolescents and maybe contemplating this, um, but much before. And, and I think that's one of the exciting parts about being a pediatrician is our opportunity to take care of these kids longitudinally and, and recognizing mental health concerns earlier and intervening. Most of the people, apparent, we, when they have done surveys, um, have, when asked, you know, did they see, or when their families were asked, you know, did they see a medical professional before they tried uh, attempting suicide and actually completed suicide? 80% of teenagers visited a healthcare provider the year before they tried to um, kill themselves or actually succeeded in committing suicide. 38% um, of teenagers actually had seen a primary care provider in the last month uh, prior to committing suicide. So the bottom line message is that we can make a difference by screening for suicide risk in the medical setting. There are multiple ways to think about how to do this. Um, in our blueprint for youth suicide prevention, we break it down into three tiers. So the first and the broadest of this upside down pyramid is screening. So by screening, that doesn't take very long. 
Um, and it's an opportunity for us to begin that conversation. Um, the second part of that tier is for those who uh, say that they have been thinking about suicide or um, may even have a plan that we need to do a safety assessment in order to ensure that they are okay. That does take longer um, and can be outsourced if there are resources in your community to do that, um, but there are ways to do that in practice. And then the bottom of the pyramid are those who are seriously um, at risk where we need uh, more intervention, um, which includes a full mental health evaluation, um, which may be inpatient or outpatient, depending on the level of risk. So there is a difference between screening and assessment. Um, screening is essentially trying to identify in a very broad basis across the population who might be at risk. Um, and a screening is typically a standardized screening and can be done on paper, uh, can be done verbally or done on a computer, depending on how you do assessments now um, for, for any type of screening. Once you identify through a screening that someone may be at risk, then an assessment is more comprehensive. And this is where we determine what level of risk the child is at, um, whether or not there's immediate risk of danger, and then guides us on next steps. So the screening, let's talk about that for a bit. Um, so what age should we start to screen? Um, there are multiple ages, of course, where this can happen. We know that it can be uh, most common in our adolescents and our young adults. And however, uh, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more kids who are younger who have contemplated suicide. And sometimes the question is whether or not they are truly suicidal or if they're having thoughts. I remember once when my youngest son, I have four kids, when my youngest son, uh, when he was seven said, you know, I don't know why I'm here. And, and he was very sad, um, but understanding that, is that a suicidal question a, or is it just a way for a, a child expressing that he has feelings and he has concerns and he's feeling sad and how can we help to intervene appropriately? Um, anyone who's trained can do this suicide screening. Um, here we have some recommendations and of course I would make it appropriate for your clinic population or your health system population, but generally our adolescents 12 years and older, universal screening can be appropriate for your younger children. If their signs or symptoms or concerns, then screening would also be appropriate. Um, under, eight, under age eight, maybe less appropriate to do a suicide screen. There aren't many um, really gold standard screening tests that have been validated for that age group. Um, so it may be more of a conversation to see whether or not this is truly a suicidal thought or behavior or a symptom of something else. Um, an example screening tool is the um, ASQ test. Um, so ask suicide screening questionnaire. Um, this is different than the developmental questionnaire. We have another one called ASQ for development. This is different. This is specifically for suicide. And again, if you go out, uh, you can find this online. It's free. You can Google it to get it. Um, I would highly recommend it. As you can see, it's not very long, uh, but however, it is important to know that if you get a positive answer that you need to know what to do. And so again, the blueprint for youth suicide prevention has all of these steps in there. And so I'm going through them in my talk, but feel free to download that. You can find that on our website at aap.org so that you can um, go through it. It has all of the steps and the processes. Um, and then also AAP has policy in place, which you can also refer to. Um, so you can also just screen for depression. In my practice, I run a large practice and we screen for depression. Uh, and so we use um, something called the PHQ-9, which we use to screen for, for, um, for um, depression symptoms. And then the last questions, or last two questions, say, ask about suicide screening. And so um, you absolutely can. You can use that as a suicide screener. Um, however, if I, what I would recommend, though, is that if you get a positive answer on um, the PHQ-9, that you then give the ASQ to get more information. Um, at the, the depression screening questionnaire may or may not pick it up also um, because of the way the questions are worded. So if you're truly trying to screen for suicide risk, a um, suicide risk screening tool like the ASQ would be much better. Um, and again, there are alternatives to this as well. And, and so I would just highly recommend taking a look at what's available and then deciding what makes sense for your practice. 
Um, but when a patient screens positive, you know, that's when, um, you know, your heart drops and, and you, and you start to worry about your patient. Um, and then you also know that this is going to be a much deeper conversation in your day at the clinic. Uh, it is important to realize that not every patient who is, um, having suicidal ideation is an emergency. Um, you may be thinking about hurting yourself, but you may not have a plan um, or you may not truly intend to do it. And so that is where the assessment part comes in. Um, so there are some things that we need to do if we know that someone is suicidal, for example, making sure that they have a one-on-one -on -one sitter, um, removing devices, making sure that they're um, being monitored for a period of time. That may not be necessary if someone is just thinking about suicide. So that's where the assessment is truly important. So that's tier two. And so the brief safety, suicide safety assessment is the next step. So why do we do a safety assessment? You know, obviously it's important that um, we want to make sure obviously the child is safe and that the family also understands what to do if a child is contemplating suicide. One of the um, issues in the United States, and it may be where you are as well, is that we don't have enough people to take care of children who have mental health conditions. The pandemic has exacerbated a pre-existing mental health crisis where we have so many young people who are anxious, depressed, and maybe contemplating hurting themselves that we don't have enough resources, meaning we don't have enough therapists, we don't have enough psychiatrists, we don't have enough inpatient beds uh, to take all of the children who are just thinking about hurting themselves. Now, if they are actually at risk for suicide, they do need to be in a setting, in an inpatient setting or an emergency room setting so that we can ensure that they're safe while they're being stabilized and so that they can get the care that they need. And so all of this conversation is really to help us think about, well, when we see a child who is thinking about hurting themselves, when do we pull the alarm? You know, when do we say, oh, this is a problem, this child needs to be hospitalized or in the emergency room. Um, and then, or when are they okay? And we're not worried about that, but we need to do um, something because clearly this child is suffering from depression or anxiety or something else. And, um, and then the green is low risk, you know, where we don't need to do anything else at this time. One of the keys in the assessment though is safety planning. Um, ensuring that if a child feels unwell and feels like they do wanna hurt themselves, what are we doing to make sure that they stay safe? Um, similar to how you might think about, you know, wearing cars, uh, seat belts in a car or putting a fence around a pool, you know, to make sure that children stay safe um, in various situations, it's the same idea. We wanna make sure that the family can ensure that their child is safe and is not going to hurt themselves successfully while they're in this um, um, this hopefully temporary moment where they are thinking about hurting themselves. Um, also at making sure that if there is a gun in the home or medications that the child can access, which may be lethal, that we're locking those up, keeping them away from the child and then in providing resources for the families as well. So if you do want to embark upon this, it's a big deal. You know, I, I have a large practice and it's important that if you want to address suicide and suicidal safety, that we as providers are adequately trained and that there are people in your practice who want to focus on this. It's not, um, it's not easy, but it's completely doable. Um, and, and so depending on how much training you've had or, um, or you've had in your residency, this can feel very daunting, right? It can feel really scary. And again, I, because of the situation we're in, where the pandemic has made mental health conditions uh, more of an issue, the culture and the environment has a change with the engagement of social media and other things that our children are being exposed to, um, that we are seeing more and more kids with mental health conditions. And it's important as pediatricians that we be more comfortable with managing mental health issues um, because we will be the ones to see it. We'll be the ones to see it in our practices and we will need to know 
what to do. Connecting with people in your community who do this work is really important. So uh, partnering and integrating with them can be very helpful. And then um, making sure that what you are asking parents to do, if they go home with their child who may be sad or depressed or anxious um, or contemplating um, suicide, you know, it's really important that we make sure that the families are comfortable and that they feel like they have all the tools and resources that they need. Um, so training, training, training is super important, not just for yourself, but for your staff as well. Um, having, you know, there are things that we would love to see in place. I mean, in the best uh, magical wand type of environment, we could make, wave a magic wand and say, there's plenty of access to mental health care uh, providers. Let's make sure that we have, um, uh, you know, that we just refer and somebody will do it for us. Um, that, of course, is a long-term hope, um, but today may not be in place. Um, and, and so, again, through the blueprint, take a look at it. There are lots of different things to do um, in order to get ready to do this work. And then once you're doing this work, um, things, skills and tools for you to be able to use. Um, Focusing with your and partnering with your community and schools is also incredibly important. Often these young people will be identified in school as having depression or anxiety symptoms or maybe contemplating suicide. And they may reach out to you, the pediatric provider, to ask for help. And so having those um, partnerships is really important. There are so many places where um, you can collaborate in order to do work like this. And depending on your level of interest and your goals in your community and in your practice, you can um, just focus on your practice and your patients, or you can get bigger, right? And you can work in your community to improve access to mental health care in your communities. And so um, just wanted to let you know that the blueprint that I keep referring to also has guidance in there for all of these different groups as well. So if uh, you know of a school that's really interested or other groups um, that are interested in figuring out what to do for suicide prevention, um, you may wanna point them towards the blueprint for guidance. So building that partnership is um, important, like I said, and identifying who they are, understanding what's available. When I started work, I'm a general pediatrician. And when I first started doing work in youth mental health, I didn't know. I, I really didn't know. I was a general pediatrician. I understood, you know, my well checks and my sick visits, but I wasn't familiar with all the mental health resources in my community, who I could turn to, who, could, who I could send patients to. It did take some time for me to learn all of that, but I will tell you it's worth it because then when you have your, you know, that 16 year old in front of you who is deeply depressed and thinking about hurting themselves, um, I feel just much more knowledgeable, knowing who I can refer to or what I need to do today to help that child and that family so that I can help them get care. Um, or if I can actually do things myself to help take care of them, all of those things have made me um, feel more, imp more empowered to do this work. The same way how if you had a child with a cardiac condition, you, um, you know, would learn how to do it up to a point, right? We're not surgeons, we're not cardiologists. Um, um, at least um, I'm not. And so when I have a cardiac question, I, you know, there's a up to a point where I'm comfortable and I am, um, I know sort of the signs and the symptoms that I need to watch for, for a cardiac condition. And I know when it's an emergency and I know when it's not, and it can wait till tomorrow or next week or for a referral to a cardiologist. And, and that's where you want to try to get yourself to and your colleagues to for mental health. You know, when do we know uh, what, when we can get ourselves to a point where we know what to do, and then there's a point where we don't know what to do, and we, then we have to refer to our specialists. Um, suicide is often uh, preventable, not always. Um, there are, we, we are still understanding how um, people are um, more prone to suicide, who's more likely to be successful in completing suicide. Um, but sometimes it's preventable and, and, and it's important for us to be able to focus on that because as I mentioned, suicide is the second leading cause of death for us for our 10 to 24 year olds. 
And there are more people who die from suicide than from many of our medical conditions. Um, in fact, if you add up the next five to eight medical conditions that cause um, young people to die, uh, there are more children who die from suicide than if you added up all of those other conditions together um, that cause death in children. And so we really need to focus on this. This is a pediatric issue. But there is another piece to this. So what if instead of relying on children to be more resilient, we create a world that's less traumatic? So when we talk about youth mental health, I think preventing suicide in our offices, in our clinics are incredibly important, but it is important for us as pediatricians and as child health advocates to focus on what is happening in the world around our children and our young people that is leading them potentially down this path. And so really this generation of children, especially those under age 10, they don't know a world without the internet. You know, in fact, they don't know a world where you can't just talk into the air to give commands to play music if they have smart devices in their homes um, or they're used to being able to do FaceTime or or WhatsApp or any of the devices and just talk to people, um, you know, on the other side of the world in a different country. And that's normal to them. And so as we they are growing up in this world of technology, how do we ensure that children are safe? Um, Amnesty International collected responses from um, several hundred children and young people between 13 and 24 across 45 countries to better understand their lived experiences, concerns, and attitudes towards uh, social media. And, uh, you know, a month, uh, what they saw is that even though people um, had good things to say about social media, um, there were two major concerns that stood out about the harmful content and um, what many young participants described as an addictive uh, piece to um, uh, social media. So 74% of kids and young people said that they actually are checking their social media more often than they want to. Um, and, and the reason for that is really interesting that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so this feeling of addiction, you know, here you can see um, that in Mexico, and this is adults and teenagers. So in the green is the teenagers, about half of teenagers feel like they're addicted um, to their devices. And you can see the parents aren't that far behind. 45% of parents feel like they're addicted to their devices. The people who create social media platforms know who's addicted and they also know who's using it and for how long and at what age groups. They have so much data on us. Um, you can see here in Argentina that they, you all actually, in, in Argentina, they top the market. Um, and, and so in Mexico, you're about midway down the list. And so here, we see just the number of hours that people are spending on their devices in social media. I, I think it's important to know that we need to provide resources for families. Um, this is a um, platform that we put together on our face, our parent facing website, healthychildren.org, which is both in English and Spanish to help families create a media plan for their children and set limits. When we look at social media, we know that there's some benefits, you know, that children can find people like them, young adults who, especially those who are in marginalized populations, can find like-minded friends. And in fact, 90% of teenagers, when we ask them, they're actually talking to their real life friends just on social media. And so the idea that social media is all bad is not true. Uh, there are some benefits to social media and, and that ability to connect is really important. However, there are there are problems with it, as we all know. So the ability for bullying to happen, um, digital drama, when you're always being shown pictures of perfection, you know, that promotes unhealthy social comparisons. Um, this is not something that the that is something that's happening because of the internet per se. Um, it, we do know that there are challenges behind what social media companies are doing in that they have algorithms in place that understand and are paying attention to how 
what is keeping you attached to your device? Um, they have multiple teams of psychologists and behavioralists that look at ways to keep you attached to your device and using their platform. And the reason for that is because they that's how they monetize themselves, right? This is how the economy works. It's called the attention economy. So when they, uh, for example, in some social media platforms, and, and most of them now, there's something called endless scroll. So endless scroll means that when you're using your device, you can just swipe up on your screen over and over again. And then and there just and never ends. You know, you can get a feed of photos and posts just forever. And they use that method to keep you attached and using a psychological tool called fear of missing out um, as an example. So if you, the psychological tool is that if you stop swiping, if you stop looking, then the very next thing, the next thing that you could have seen might be have been the funniest thing or the greatest thing or the most important thing um, there. And so that, that ability to that tool of keeping us attached to our devices, using um, games, using rewards, using likes and not, you know, not likes and uh, comments, um, all the star ratings, all of those things are psychological tools that are designed to keep us attached to our devices. And so for our young people to ask them just to stop using devices actually doesn't work very well. And so AAP is launching a uh, center on excellence uh, for social media and youth mental health, where we're working with our young people and also researchers to see, you know, what are the um, things that we need to be paying attention to? How do we, um, you know, know what works, what doesn't work? How do we make sure that young people are safe when they're using digital media? I did want to talk very briefly about AI as well. So with AI, um, there is this is a newly growing, fast growing industry. Um, certainly in the United States, we are seeing um, lots and lots of startups in this area. And, and so it is important for us to pay attention to this as pediatricians. So you can see on this picture, this young girl is looking at the sort of egg shaped device. What this device does that exists today is it records a parent's voice, a parent talking. And with that, it can then use the parent's voice to talk and to tell stories. And the idea behind the device is that it can tell your child bedtime stories using your own voice, the parent's voice. And, uh, you know, one has to wonder why you would want that. But, you know, the thing is, is that when a child is hearing their parent's voice coming out of a device, chances are they may eventually develop feelings towards that advice, that device. And, and, I, and I know that sounds far, maybe far-fetched, but if you have any kind of a smart device on your phone, or um, if you have a watch that's smart or anything like that, um, if you've ever talked to it, and tried to give it a command, and then you've gotten upset because the, it didn't quite understand you properly, right? Um, and then you get you repeat your command maybe, and you may get you know louder or whatever. But but basically, you're interacting with it like it's alive, um, like it's a thing, and you're having feelings towards it. And so it's not that unusual for us to think about what that might look like. And so if you remember, remember I said in social media that the idea there is to keep your attention to a device. So the attention economy. In AI, it's called the relationship economy. So in that case, what we're actually, what they're trying to do is the AI that gets you attached to it the fastest is the winner um, and they will be monetizing that. And so um, this is truly a challenge. And in many AI devices, you can talk to, you know, favorite characters, you can talk to historical characters, you can even create your own AI friend and in, um, Instagram or Snapchat, you can do that already. And so when there is an artificial intelligence that is device that is aimed at children, geared towards children, it is important that we as pediatricians, as the experts on childhood development and early childhood brain development, that we are a part of that conversation so that we can ensure that this is going to be safe for children. Um, so 
on to another topic, you know, really still talking about development and how we are going to help kids and, and how do we help children now and what can we do differently perhaps in our practices to ensure that children stay healthy, that suicide doesn't become a topic for them, um, or when they encounter AIs and things that they know how to stay strong and, and resilient. Trauma-informed care is very much a part of that and understanding how trauma affects children and our brain development is important. Um, hopefully you've had some exposure to this, um, but if not, um, just understanding that when we think about trauma, um, most children have been through some form of trauma. And we also know that when you've been exposed to trauma, that it has an impact on your brain development. Um, so uh, developing a trauma-informed approach in our practices is really critical. So to start with, you know, we need to think about, well, what does trauma do to us physiologically? Um, toxic stress, hopefully, is a concept you've heard of before. Um, so you can have good stress, right? And so giving a, a talk, for example, that's a good stress. I can, you know... It, makes me practice, it makes me get ready for a talk, it helps me to get the presentation together. A little bit of stress is not bad. Um, tolerable stress is where things are a little more challenging, but it's still tolerable and it can be okay. Toxic stress is a very different thing though. And toxic stress is when, for example, if you're in abusive household and as a child, you're you know either being abused or you're seeing abuse um, or being exposed to it, or you're seeing violence, um, things like that. And, and it's not going away. You're, you're always exposed to sort of this prolonged activation of stress. And that does cause a problem um, in that it creates uh, stress on our uh, physiology and changes our expression of genes and, um, and so forth. So neuroscience explains how stress can become biologically embedded in children and adults. And we all know about the fight flight freeze response that happens, you know, when we're exposed to something very scary, like a, you know, if there's a bear in our, in our tracks, when we're, we're, you know, in our primitive days, it, that exposure to the bear uh, was, in, was, it was important for us to know that we needed to run away, or we needed to fight the bear or we needed to freeze and not move and hope he went away right so those responses were very appropriate when that was the kind of stress that was being exposed to us um however the life has changed you know so unless you're out hiking um you know where bears are that's not really a thing anymore but when we see other things that are threatening we still have the same response so our our brains have a a, a physiologic mechanism where we um express epinephrine and norepinephrine and cortisol in response to being exposed to um, a threat, um, or we may go down the freeze pathway instead. The challenge is though that over time, that prolonged exposure to cortisol and other neurotransmitters um, if, are harmful. They're harmful to our brains, especially when we're little and we're still growing our brains. It actually, we know that it has physiologic effects to our immune systems. It has a physiologic express to our genetic expression. And so childhood trauma can actually lead to adult disease. And so how do we, fight against that. You know, what do we, what can we do? What can we teach parents to help mitigate against that? And what we've learned through science is that we can help. And the way that we do that is through building relationships. And why does this work? Well, there's another pathway. And so when biology has the answer, right, we, it turns out that in addition to the fight, flight, freeze response, there's a fourth response and that's called the affiliate response. And it's mediated by the hormone oxytocin in certain brain structures. Um, and that's called the affiliate network. And what happens is that this network, which includes the amygdala and parts of the midbrain, is that it helps to mitigate the impacts of those harmful long-term exposures to cortisol, for example, um, and, and helps to mitigate that response and helps to mediate the response to our immune systems and our genetic expression and, and the like. Um, sorry that on the slide, that uh, reference is a little out of, um, in the wrong spot, but either way, the concept is that oxytocin can be very protective. 
And so when we're talking to families and we see, for example, a child that's misbehaving and the parents are struggling, you know, the question is not what is wrong with you for the child, um, but what happened to you? What happened to you growing up that has resulted in being creating the circumstance and the behavior that you're in? And also to focus on what's strong with you. What is that child really good at? You know, how can we ensure that um, that we're focusing on the positives and the strength-based approach? That's also true for the parents because the parents are asking for our advice. And again, often we start to think about, well, what can we tell them is wrong with their parenting approach? That's not actually what we want to do. We actually want to talk about what's strong with them and maybe what happened to the parents that led them to um, be thinking this way or feeling this way. Uh, strength, stress, and anxiety also manifest differently in different people. So below the iceberg line, you can see here there, we may be feeling things like anxiety, uh, being jealous, being uncomfortable, being ashamed. Um, but what happens is that our behavior, our outward behavior to the rest of the world looks more like anger or lack of focus or sleep, not sleeping well or avoidance um, over planning. So it is important for us to interpret behaviors based on what feelings may be underneath that. So to sort of summarize that, what is key and most important, so the factors which predispose children to positive outcomes in the face of, adverse, of adversity, the single most uh, common factor for children is that one safe, stable, committed relationship with a supportive parent, caregiver, or adult. And through a child's lifetime, that can be different adults, um, but it is important for parents to understand that having that safe, stable, nurturing relationship, basically important, making sure that affiliate response happens is the most important mitigating factor um, to protecting a child against adverse outcomes. So as we do this type of work, it's challenging as we're talking about suicide and we're talking about mental health issues, talking about trauma. As a clinician, as a pediatrician, as a um, primary caregiver, uh, you know, a first, uh, first contact giver, it, it's so important for us to be taking care of ourselves too. You know, we're givers, we're naturally givers, pediatricians, we care about others. We spend our lives taking care of others. Our people at home need us, our people in our organizations need us, patients need us, uh, but we have needs too. And it's really not about us, right? How big our hearts are, you know, our hearts are endless, um, but it's much more about how big our brains are. You know, how much can we take? How, how much of all the things happening in the world can we handle? Um, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as being as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. Um, when we are dealing with very serious, very heavy issues, maybe with patients that we've known and cared for for a very long time, that can be super hard. Um, you know, I remember, you know, being uh, so sad and, and just having my tears in my own eyes when one of my patients tried to kill himself and tried to hurt himself. And the mom was just in tears. I was in tears. It was just, you know, that emotional attachment we have with our patients is real and very strong. And so it's important that we have a way that we can help mitigate our own feelings and our own um, impact, the impacts of the work that we do on our own lives. Um, it is important for us to accept what we can't control. Um, we're often as scientists, we want to control things. We want to see the, you know, do something and see an outcome, a cause and effect. But in the reality, feelings don't work that way necessarily. And that can be hard to understand uh, or accept as scientists. Uh, this circle I took from a, a third grade website. So it, it's for children, but it absolutely works for us. You know, the things we can control are our own words, our own actions, um, things that we do, that we can control our own behaviors, but we can't control or other people's behaviors and other people's thoughts um, and what's happening and other people's uh, feelings, you know, what they do. And, and so it's important to not try to um, feel things if you can help it uh, based on other people's behaviors. You know, we, we need to, we, we can focus only on ourselves. Compassion fatigue is a real 
thing. Um, moral injury is another topic that um, can impact our own well-being. And compassion fatigue was originally a concept for nurses um, and also for people who are taking care of family members at home with chronic illnesses, where basically when you're taking care of someone for such a long time, it can be exhausting and taking care of others can be exhausting. And the reality is we've just been through a giant pandemic, a, a multiple years of a lot of work, and that can be exhausting. Um, so compassion fatigue is a real disorder. I think understanding that it has symptoms, there are cognitive ones, emotional ones, behavioral ones, physical ones. Um, you know, I won't go through all of them, but certainly feeling of uh, guilt or anger or apathy, not sleeping well, having our own issues with our own physical health, um, immune system issues, increased medical concerns for ourselves, feeling sadness or hopeless. Um, these are all uh, symptoms of, of compassion fatigue. If you have symptoms of compassion fatigue, um, for example, if you're tired of talking about, you know, trying to, to convince a family to get COVID vaccines um, or trying to convince them to, um, you know, have their child exercise more, you know, or eat healthier. If you, if you get to the point where you don't feel like talking about that anymore because you just don't care or you just know the answer and you just don't want to deal with it, um, there may be some evidence of compassion fatigue for you. Compassion fatigue is a bit more like PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, than it is um, just burnout. You know, burnout's a little different. Burnout, typically, it's because, you know, what your schedule is exhausting, um, your, your days are long. Um, you can help combat burnout by taking a vacation or meditating or yoga, you know, some exercise, all those good things that are good for us. Um, compassion fatigue is slightly different. You may need therapy. You might need professional help uh, to help you work your way through, through that. So um, that's important to recognize as well. And I encourage you to get help if you need to. Um, but on a positive note, you know, in pediatrics, we get to do some amazing things. We get to take care of some incredible kids, um, incredible families. Vicarious resilience is a concept I want to put before you where, you know, with resilience, we've all had children we've taken care of who may have been super sick, you know, very, very ill um, in the ICU, perhaps, or having had surgery. And we weren't sure if they were going to make it right. And, but they did. Right. They did. And not only did they make it, but they were, you know, within a as, as they were getting better, they were smiling, they were playful, they were children and they were happy. And so it's really exciting as pediatricians to be a part of that and being able to watch children be resilient. We can actually experience that, too. So not only when they are sad, we experience sadness, um, but when they're resilient, we can experience resilience with them. And it feels amazing, you know, it helps us understand and put things in perspective. It keeps us energized. It tells us, reminds us of why we do what we do. It gives us hope. Um, and it's so important that, um, you know, we experience that vicarious resilience you know, remembering why we do what we do. Uh, one of my favorite parts of going to work is listening to pediatricians going into exam rooms to greet a patient, you know, and when you walk into a room to see your patient, you know, what do you typically do? Um, chances are you put a smile on your face and you walk in and for that moment, you're happy, right? You're happy to see that child. You're happy for that patient. Um, and we know it's so important to do that. And when we do that, we feel it as well. Um, it, when we were, you know, minutes ago, before you walked into that exam room, you might've been tired, you may have been stressed, um, but for that few minutes, when you walk into the room, um, you're not, you know, and you're able to focus on that family and that child. The reality is we can do that anytime we want. Um, we choose to do it when we walk into an exam room, but I think it's really important for us to remember that we decide ourselves, you know, what can we control? We can tr control our own feelings, our own behaviors. And so if you're having a long day, instead of focusing on the one thing that didn't go well, because that's human nature to do that, can you instead focus on all the things that did go well that day and the patients who are really grateful for you and the things that happened that were very successful. And so just remembering why we do what we do. I did want to just leave you with that. Um, I think it's so important as we go forward and especially as we think about really complicated things like mental health, um, how we ensure that we preserve our own mental health health when we do that.
So thank you so much for your attention and your time. I appreciate the honor of being able to present to you all today. Um, and I thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you for all that you're doing for children and families in your communities.